Good, thank you. Uh, so this talk is going to address the nature of the yielding transition, an issue which has not been discussed so much in this program. And this talk is woven around our uh, two experiments, one dealing with binary colloidal glass, uh, 3D binary colloidal glass, and the other uh, 2D amorphous bubble raft. And uh, we will see uh, what is the situation as of now on understanding this yielding transition. And I'm not sure that the final answer is known, but that's the purpose of, I guess, uh, this uh, discussion. At the end, I'll put some questions and some speculations. So this work is uh, was done when Hima, uh, Mansa, and Shreyas were in G, uh, and with me uh, as PhD student, and Shreemai is the one present on this bubble raft, and that is a uh, kind of a trailer for more elaborate work on the same system uh, for memory uh, issues, which I'll be talking in the memory conference. But here, I'll just touch upon the yielding issue uh, on this bubble raft. These are the experiments which Srimai uh, has done, uh, started by Nilima. And uh, all this is uh, with Rajesh in uh, JNC. And this is the part which I will not have time, but these are also some more experiments on two-dimensional films using interfacial rheology of a, a surfactant film, a lipid film. And there also we see some interesting issues on yielding of that film. So, so let me just uh, tell the basic facts of life, which we all know, but it's no harm to remind ourselves on a Friday afternoon that uh, all solids, be it atomic crystals, metallic glasses, dense suspension, gels, foams, they all exhibit yielding. And uh, plastic flow at sufficiently large external stresses. And in crystalline materials, over the years, uh, there is a consensus um, uh, that the yielding occurs via motion of well-defined topological defects called dislocations. Uh, not such a consensus in the case of uh, amorphous materials. And in this case, when crystalline materials, the local yield events, namely the dislocations, move collectively and self-organize into avalanches that follow power law scaling and hence yielding is looked as a phase transition in these systems. So there are many examples for uh, crystalline materials. I have taken a very uh, selective few just to give you a feel because the focus is on amorphous systems and not on crystalline. So in crystal plasticity, in atomic systems, there have been experiments over the last uh, uh, 20 years, 30 years, where they have looked at uh, uh, this avalanches or the scaling behavior of these events. For example, in acoustic uh, emission experiments on bulk crystals of uh, ice, which follow this power law, I apologize for not being so clear, but just to show that there is a scaling behavior in the acoustic uh, emission. Then uh, scale-free intermittent flow in crystal plasticity. Again, uh, number of uh, events uh, which occur. Uh, uh, this, I'm not defining exactly these events, but they are all related to the motion of dislocations. And uh, relatively more recently in colloidal crystals, uh, where they have looked at dislocation velocity, that, that also exhibit, exhibit power law. So there are more experiments in the literature. I will not uh, give you a catalog of this. In, so in the flow regime or in yeah. the flow regime? Uh, they are in the flow regime. Yeah. So it's there always power law or is it power law? These are the systems which show power law. But only at the uh, Yeah, at close to the yield point. Close to the yield point. Not yet melted. But uh, uh, in atomic system, uh, in amorphous systems, there have been few experiments. For example, uh, in 2010, they had looked at the uh, stress drops, the magnitude of uh, stress drops as you go to the yielding, and they plotted that uh, distribution, and that also has some uh, kind of a power law with exponent 1.5. 
so there is no uh, very uh, established understanding of these things but they are all believed that they are all related to avalanches and hence there should be some criticality uh, at the yield point on colloidal glasses uh, so let me just give you uh, a few slides on what uh, experiments have been done i'll be focusing morely more on the experiments uh, and uh, occasionally refer to some simulations uh, here uh, the uh, very early first work on 2007 by uh, peter shawl dave whites and spenen so they have looked at uh, colloidal glasses uh, i have not written volume fraction about uh, 60% hard sphere colloids and they have looked at uh, 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 this as a function of uh, uh, shear but at a extremely slow shear rate this uh, shear rate is which i have not written 2 into trans per minus 5 second inverse and uh, they look at uh, 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 this uh, and plot for example this is the strain amplitude and this is uh, in this uh, uh, yz in this velocity velocity gradient plane uh, which uh, and they show that uh, there are four fold patterns in the spatial autocorrelation of the local st uh, stress field strain field and uh, this is uh, the dominant deformation mechanism in glasses which are called the shear transformation zones so there have been lot of uh, uh, efforts on uh, uh, efforts in identifying stz but it's probably uh, the best to see in soft matter systems where the sc uh, length scales are large and uh, they, they behave as shall be inclusions as was uh, predicted and local regions of high plastic strain that couple elastically to the surrounding me material and uh, there have been other experiments of similar type uh, but with more uh, uh, meat added to the physics for example in this again from peter shaw group in 2011 uh, again a similar gamma dot 1.5 rest per minus 5 second and again they are looking at long range strain correlations in the sheared colloidal glasses and they look at uh, for example this uh, strain spatial correlation function and uh, how it decays uh, there are other experiments for example in 2014 uh, by uh, these people again uh, they have looked at uh, the uh, similar kind of things so here if you look at the shear strain it increases from 0 to Uh, let's say 10% and then comes down and the shear rate is again very small uh, 1 to uh, 1 into trans per minus 5 to 5 into trans per minus 5 and maximum strain is 10% and then he, they come back to see the reversibility of these plastic events again uh, i have given you a snapshot from their experiment here it is again in the uh, velocity gradient plane uh, this is again i am plotting the spatial correlation of the local strain and this is at point 0 to begin with this is here this is at the maximum point so you can see this four fold pattern so this you can see the uh, uh, here this is the strain eyz so this is the positive one and this is the negative strain which is what is in the these quadrants and this is coming from here and back to this it is this so it is not exactly uh, recovering and uh, uh, so this is what they show that how this plastic deformation is uh, uh, the patterns are looking there is another recent paper uh, again by peter shawls group uh, uh, where they are looking at direct observation of uh, percolation in yielding transition and here they are looking at the uh, clusters of non affine deformation and they show that they percolate at yielding and here if you again i don't want to go into detail but this is what they are from the experiment 1 2 3 and this is from simulation Uh, atomistic simulation and uh, this one is from mesoscale simulation and here they plot uh, the evolution of fraction p uh, 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 as a function of uh, strain and again it uh, goes 
to 1 at a particular gamma c. So, so, so here experiment is blue. No, 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 in the, in the here, yeah. these are various clusters uh -huh. uh, without, uh, so to make, uh, to make evident, these are different clusters which are appearing as you are increasing uh, uh, for example, at strain uh, 2.1, 4.9, and 10.1%. So, and the uh, yield strain, I think, is uh, I have not written, but probably it is about 3 or 4 percent. I don't remember the number, but uh, beyond that. So, um, I guess you're going to discuss this more, but in what sense is this a percolation trend? Yeah, so they look at how these growing uh, uh, clusters, they fill the whole space and uh, they uh, plot uh, that fraction and as you go towards gamma C, this non fine cluster and in that sense they call it a percolation transition. I think as uh, uh, simple as that, as a, that's what I understand. Okay, so now coming to oscillatory shear. So, so far we had been looking only in steady shear and in all these experiments, the shear rate was quite small, 10 is for minus 5 and uh, uh, the idea was to look at uh, the deformation pattern. Now, in these uh, experiments which have been done under oscillatory shear, uh, the very early experiment uh, by this group in 1997, they looked at diffusing wave spectroscopy. So idea is look at intensity-intensity correlation in a dense suspension which is not uh, very transparent. It's multiple scattering. So you can't use the simple light scattering. So you use what is called diffusing wave spectroscopy and you look at how this correlations function uh, decay and here it's oscillatory shear. So again you will have the what you call echoes and what they conclude, I'll just give you the uh, bottom line that below yield strain uh, also they see several percent of particles are rearranging irreversibly with each cycle which was quite a surprise then the other experiments uh, where uh, uh, George is involved in a couple of them two of them are here uh, they look at uh, again DWS in hard sphere glasses under oscillatory shear strain and uh, uh, so the conclusion of their uh, experiments with again using DWS is that that yielding uh, definitely marks a division between completely reversible and irreversible behavior. And even above uh, yielding, there is a sizable uh, fraction of uh, reversible events. And in these experiments, they have not looked at the transient behavior as you go towards gamma Y, let's call it. And uh, this is where the direct imaging uh, could be very useful. Now the direct imaging experiments have been done. This is probably the first of its type by on this uh, 2D jammed material on air water interface and they put a magnetic uh, this needle and they move this to make the shear and they look at the images of that and they see uh, what is called T1 events uh, which I'll probably say little more when I come to bubble raft but these are the events whether they are reversible or irreversible really define how your neighbors move. I'll uh, give, show you a cartoon of this in next in uh, two slides later and what they see that if they look at the T1 events as a function of number of cycles or the accumulated strain uh, above and below gamma y there is a change in character. So in one case it decays and other case it does not decay to zero value. Uh, but there are and this is another experiment uh, which uh, uh, again on a similar theme but on three dimensional system not on a 2D film and uh, they have looked at uh, flow curve sigma versus gamma dot and various uh, G prime, G double prime issues and so on. But in the end of the paper, I have just quoting their uh, uh, lines which will set the stage for our experiments. So they, uh, this is uh, reproduced from their paper. Uh, our finding
concerning the particle scale dynamics exhibit interesting uh, analogies with the behavior of non brownian hard sphere suspension in a viscous fluid which are subjected to oscillatory shear motion oh sorry this is pine at all uh, and so on and this is what uh, set the stage for our experiments to follow so so let us recall ourselves what are these experiments uh, on this uh, they have been discussed uh, in this meeting uh, in different uh, <coughs> talks but let me briefly recall what these experiments were and uh, from where we here uh, where do we go so in this experiment for example you have this uh, non brownian dilute suspension and you shear it in the uh, uh quiet uh, flow as a function of uh, this is the oscillatory uh, strain oh my it goes away my god okay i just wanted to show that below threshold these are stroboscopic images okay i okay <laughs> all right but uh, here it is above threshold and these are stroboscopic images to show that particles are not coming back whereas in this it was all dead which uh, only meant that uh, they came back and this uh, uh, paradigm was uh, very simply explained by a very uh, in uh, very simplistic model just based on the collisions of particles and how they explore the phase space to avoid collision and what uh, it shows is the in the simulation uh, in a very simple way that if you are below threshold and you do the number of cycles in the beginning there are irreversible events which you call uh, irreversible or active uh, particles which are shown by this dark particles and as you uh, do uh, this uh, cy uh, shear cycling it comes a stage when it is very quiet it is goes back to the starting point and this is the quiescent state or the absorbing state as uh, as it is termed and in the above threshold of course you uh, have large uh, events but they never go to zero and achieve a non steady state uh, which uh, and the number fluctuates around some value which is what you call fluctuating state or diffusing state and uh, the transition gamma c separates these two which is which they call random organization in a periodic network so here in the simulations they showed the number of active particles the one which do not come back after one cycle and you can see that in this situ situation it goes goes to the zero value in a few in some cycles whereas in this situation it goes to a non zero value and this fraction is plotted here as a function of gamma not this is the amplitude of the oscillatory strain and you can see a clear demarcation of the two regions marking this phase transition another thing which they uh, extracted from this data and experiments are also there in their uh, in this paper that they fit this to a power law and a exponential uh, for all these values of uh, gamma not which can be fitted and this tau which they extract the time it takes to make a steady state uh, it diverges uh, uh, at uh, gamma c and gamma c is about 2.5 uh, or something in their simul simulation same thing they have done this is the exponent which is probably i have written here this is uh, this is from the experiment on a similar system and this is close to 1.1 and this is the onset of irreversible dynamics which is termed as absorbing phase transition okay so i didn't want to elaborate in case this is again a simple model which i said they avoid collisions and this is from the experiment uh, uh, and again they see a threshold <coughs> okay so now we want to adopt this idea to the yielding transition and uh, now we will be looking not at the dilute system but at a concentrated gla glassy system and question is can they be extended and we are not the first one to think of this there are number of uh, 
simulations and experiment this is the simulation shrikant is uh, there uh, here also there is the simulation this is the experiment i showed you already and this is again the experiment where they plot the mean square displacement along y axis and there is a threshold uh, uh, at some point and it is very sharp when you have high volume fraction of 0.88 again uh, making a suggestion that there is a uh, threshold again in these in these experiments the uh, the relaxation time is not measured and uh, this is what we would like to do uh, in let's so let me discuss this experiments which were done uh, earlier and so these systems are uh, so let me define the system these are the nipa particles and uh, uh, they swell at uh, uh, low at uh, below 38 degrees so we have very easy time to change their volume fraction and uh, what you do is you make a 3d glass this is a cone plate these are both are glass and these are coated with uh, there uh, there is a immobilized layer of particles on both the plates to prevent wall slip so this is uh, we have done to prevent wall slip and uh, as far as we know there is no wall slip from the available uh, observation we have but this is not a quantitative statement that there is no wall slip the, so uh, and th what we look at is the images of this glass as it is sheared and uh, uh, so this is what is the confocal microscope uh, is here and this is the rheometer which is a commercial rheometer and they are attached to each other and this is the setup in gnc in uh, rajesh ganpati's lab other system which i'll again i just mention only preliminary results uh, and the memory talk will have more of data this is again the bubble raft on the air water interface and here uh, uh, again we are doing this kind of interfacial uh, uh, shear and we again look at this uh, uh, film as a function of gamma naught so uh, more details are here area fraction of this is 0.8 uh, and there is a lot of work on this in bubble raft in earlier papers and in this book and it's really a very beautiful system and this is a thermal because these are really big bubbles uh, for example the bubble diameter is bit, uh, bit, uh, so it's a bi disperse 1 mm and 2.5 mm and so there is no brownian uh, motion and uh, number of bubbles in the field of view is about 1300 and this is the g prime and g double prime we have this is the g prime this is the g double prime at a particular omega so this is the second system i'll just uh, show some results so uh, how much can you control the polydispersity okay so polydispersity of each one is actually about 5 uh, 10% but we want polydisperse actually because we do not want crystallization but in order to be very sure we even put the second diameter so each uh, distribution is broad and uh, then it is very sure that it will never crystallize so it's a good thing for us to have a polycrystal so just to characterize this uh, so this is the uh, which i already showed and this is what i will call the crossover point gamma y and uh, uh, this is for the bubble raft so let us see uh, what uh, we will have here i just want to make again a reference to this again very interesting work again where george is involved uh, that uh, this peak in g double prime uh, is uh, it uh, occurs in many many soft matter systems and this actually depends on what is the frequency driving frequency so uh, when you make higher frequency it moves uh, uh, out uh, 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 at higher gamma naught and they have shown that this is due to uh, two mechanisms low frequency the brownian motion assisted cage escape and at higher frequency shear induced collision so depending on omega and the relaxation time you will have this peak occurring at various gamma naught okay oh sorry i had a graph but probably all right i might have skipped that so we have done at various frequency three frequencies and shows that it shifts 
okay so let me give you the experimental results on this so we uh, look uh, stroboscopically on these particles and uh, so so this is uh, i don't think you can make out much with this but the idea is whether in one case uh, whether they are coming back and in another case whether they are not coming back as we apply more and more cycles so here let me uh, give you the uh, uh, analyzed results so these results are now done for 3d stack <coughs> so at each gamma naught uh we do as a number of cycles and at each cycle we evaluate how much which particles are reversible which particle are irreversible i'll define that quantitatively for you and here it is showing at 0.12 Uh, this fraction is 37%. Uh, so red means big irreversible particles, green means small irreversible particles, and black is reversible particles. Here at 0.25, very close to uh, 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 gamma y, here its fraction is 0.45, and uh, uh, again you can see they are distributed throughout the sam uh, in this observed volume. So this is how we. define quantitatively whether we are calling it a reversible or irreversible sorry you had a question yeah um so you have a something i didn't appreciate so these are three dimensional systems yeah correct <laughs> these are three dimensional systems yeah. and uh, you will soon realize that uh, we could not follow this as a function of number of cycles because uh, uh, it takes quite a the uh, effort and the kind of uh, issues we had with the stability so here from now onwards which i'll show i'll show you only in one plane which is about 7 microns away from the plate uh, the next results will be that but that was a three dimensional stack so here what we are doing is uh, this is uh, following uh, this approach we look at the number of nearest neighbors and we count the number of nearest neighbors of i initially let's call it uh, n initial and after one cycle we again count the number of nearest neighbors because from the g of r we know the cut off distance in your plane, sorry to interrupt the in your plane is always orthogonal to the gradient that is the problem i'll show you that and that is where we have a handicap because we are observing in velocity vorticity direction not velocity gradient direction which is unfortunate and that limits our uh, uh, some many uh, issues like the cluster size and so on with that uh, handicap i i i should have said that but uh, probably i'll say it again so here again if this number is less than 0.6623 we just chose that we call it uh, irreversible otherwise it is reversible so it does not make too much of a difference if you change this number uh, slightly on either side uh, so what we do is now this is the data on f irreversible as a function of number of cycles for various gamma knots the amplitude of this 0.05 here 0.12 this is 0.215 this is 0.25 0.37 here what we were not able to see is the initial decay very well because of all this uh, signal to noise issues with the imaging and our quantification but what we relied upon this data was this uh, asymptotic value uh, which we call f irreversible infinity and see how it behaves so this is like uh, the kind of order parameter and this is the data which is showing as a function of gamma not you can see that it is uh, a low value it is zero but here uh, so called gamma y is here but you see Uh, the data which is uh, we don't know whether it is no, uh, some deep physics which i'll mention in terms of order of the phase transition or is it our uh, inability to measure and uh, this is a, a guide to the eye with this power law 
and power law is uh, showing 0.6 but uh, we all know we have to take it with tons of salt especially at lunch time when we have such a data and this is just to indicate that there is a kind of increase or a threshold if you believe that but i'll show you a better data where there seems to be a threshold but oh. if it's just the left hand but yeah. By eye, looks like there's a jump between the blue and the. No, nee, but that data is quite. Uh, this is not shown all the uh, numbers in between, but that is quantified here exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can see that there is. A, I mean, I don't know. we have this. We had some experiments were repeated, and we have never got a very uh, zero flat zero and then increase. in these experiments but let us go further and this is uh, much cleaner so here we are measuring the bulk rheology g double prime and g double prime in a rheometer is never done as a function of time the rheometer waits for whatever time you set it let's say a five cycle or three cycle or 30 cycles and it will give you a number which will you will plot here we are plotting after every cycle g double prime and you can see that there are three values 0.04 uh, 0.25 and then this is 0.45 decay is very fast again we fit it to what pine and company had uh, recommended this uh, fit to uh, power law and exponential what and what frequency was that done at huh? what frequency was that done at one one radian per second i'm How sorry compared to the prime in time of the larger part right so uh, if you uh, so we have this number so it's not uh, so that time uh, i have forgotten but uh, it's larger than this i so it is considered high or low frequency compared to that uh, this is uh, this frequency is low if I, yeah okay. is it are you going to tell us why it's non monotonic this function of gamma naught this yeah. this one yeah It goes from 0.04 blue to yeah. 0.25, which is way up red, and then it yeah. goes down for 0.25. Yeah. Why is it not monotonic? Okay. You can tell us that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now let me see if I tell you that, but okay. <laughs> at least I'll uh, come back to it. So first, let me plot this data and uh, uh, show you how the, this data looks from G double prime. This is the G prime uh, double prime data plotted as a function of gamma naught. and uh, this on a log log plot and here uh, from this what we estimate what we uh, get is uh, 1.1 from the experiments again there is a enormous spread here whatever it is and this is what uh, we get that it is consistent it can also be put 1 or 1.1 our data is not sensitive to that but uh, 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 this is uh, very close to what this uh, theory uh, uh, paper from uh, gautam menon and uh, shriram ramaswamy suggest for uh, conserved directed percolation Uh, model for 2D. Okay, so let me just first come to the little more robust data to show whether our uh, order parameter is uh, that noisy near gamma y. Is it experimental artifact or is it some deep thing? We still don't know. So here, what we are looking again, we are looking at this bubble raft and we are identifying this uh, T1 events. where we look at uh, these two particles are here and when they become irreversible we call it irreversible t1 events so reversible t1 events at the end of the cycle uh, because this neighboring neighbors are adjusted or irreversible now this uh, uh, here we have plotted uh, all those uh, events below and above yield and uh, these things have been used in the literature uh, on bubble raft actually it's quite a rich field and this paper in 2008 exactly looked at reversible plastic events in amorphous uh, bubble raft and here uh, for example in their paper they have given this is through uh, one uh, uh, cycle 1 uh, 
then it comes back then it goes in the other direction uh, fifth is the back to it and you can see that this and this are same so this is the reversible t1 event and if you look at irreversible t1 event if you compare this with this it is irreversible so they are looking so we are looking at t1 events how many of them are reversible how many of them are irreversible and this is what uh, uh, they have uh, done as a function of strain and uh, they relate this uh, events uh, to uh, uh, the concept of stzs in bubble raft because uh, these are the the transition from a mostly reversible events to macroscopic plastic flow uh, with mainly irreversible t1 event and this is a direct experiment confirmation of blah blah of stzs and so on so this is just a suggestion they are making so, so when i look at some of the pictures which i, I think are intended to be reversible uh, here this, for instance in a so a1 a2 yeah i see small differences in the distance ha so the distances are not exactly same but the point is whether the nearest neighbors are switching well, within some uh, cut off uh, I, I, i get that but i'm i'm asking a slightly different question which is uh if when we do the experiment in granular materials where we can measure the forces we find actually the particles typically almost always come back under a cycle if we don't break them break the system uh and uh but the forces change uh and so they will they will fluctuate out into nitrogen even though the particles have returned and so if i if i want to think in a more generalized on sample yeah. i also want to know about what the forces are doing yeah And, and which we have no idea okay. because uh, this is the advantage of your granular medium okay. exactly okay. so in okay let me say it which But we have shouldn't that matter for shear stress in yeah 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 it a uh, lot of things matter in life you have to oh, depend no, on what no, you can no, do no, you have to depend no no I, 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 on a serious yes. note i am saying answer is yes question is uh, we have some idea on bubble raft it is possible uh because under bifringence you if you see these bubbles they do have uh, the kind of pattern which you showed but the whole theoretical uh, uh, underpinning of that has not been done no, uh, the the pine picture has no concept of stresses or forces in it but the correct. plastic leaving stuff yeah, has forces, has forces. Correct. correct so pine experiment yeah. was the beginning of this thought here it is not even clear because in our experiments if we are these are brown uh, our colloidal glass was brownian and the critical shear uh, rate would be zero because there will be no uh, uh, reversible path for the dilute one the, the reversible and irreversible came there only when the particle particle interaction uh, at the higher volume fraction you have to realize that it's a big jump what they did for very dilute suspension we are now taking over to concentrated system i understand i'm just saying i think that picture had no no even try to think of stresses no 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 these are just collisions actually it's two body collision which they are optimizing absolutely right so this is what we quantify I'm sorry no i, I uh, and, and this comment i mean uh, it's clear, it's very clear that when you're looking at a granular system the no, reversibility <coughs> cannot be positional <coughs> position is not but, but i i thought the bubble rafts were considered to be as close to frictionless these are frictionless he's talking about friction he's saying the positions yeah. are not the same just the neighbor <coughs> well there's small differences so the forces are going to change no yeah. the, the these are friction less particles yeah, so friction less not yeah, particle bubble that is the case um, then look i mean of course you're doing an approximation in terms of how we measure the positions but we are just looking at the neighbors correct but that the neighbors coming back doesn't mean the forces are the same if the distances have changed that's all i think what right? yes george yeah but uh, related to that in other experiments for example in the experiments that you saw with the dws there essentially you measure the reversibility by light scattering and that is quite sensitive not only on the where the particles uh, whether the neighbors are the same but whether the distances are the same yes. that's so what we call the reversible or irreversible is essentially when we say 100% reversible means that the particle the, uh, the, the whole structure has 
been yeah. uh, uh, exactly Come back. the same. Then, right? then, yeah. then, then okay. I can That's right. That Absolutely. And, and there we do uh, relate, actually, also in your in the previous experiments by Fine and uh, Pascal. And there was also actually another group that did the same experiment in WS Echo on phones. I think Cohen and Dan or something like that. Anyway, so in all these measurements, essentially. This is the one which I showed. One. That's the one. Ah, that's the one. All right. So oh, this all, is the, you mean this? No, it was a PRL. <coughs> yes, it, I think it's Cohen and Dan. Cohen and Dan was PRL at the same time exactly. Yeah, yeah. With, uh, Pascal and Pines. Okay, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, the same yeah I think I uh, might have so seen it. There, essentially, the irreversibility was related in all these cases with the yielding. By? With the yielding. Right. Right. So right. that was the, the, the idea. Yes, the right. But what is usual when you did the US in foams is really different than what you usual when you do when you're doing this experiment in emulsions. Yes. And really, in foams, this is very similar to what is measured here because the, the coherent length of the of the light is uh, of the order of magnitude of the size of the bubbles. Yes. Which is not the case in the emulsions. In a, in a and uh, of the colloids. Absolutely. Uh, which is a bit. Yeah. Different. So there will be different. Because right. the length scale also matters. Correct. So here. Uh, this is the uh, data on that uh, one of the bubble rafts. Uh, uh, irreversible uh, T1. The, again, we are plotting the uh, uh, long time behavior. And this is something which is very close to zero up to this point one, and then it takes off. So we do not have that much scatter before gamma y in these systems. Here it seems to be going uh, from almost zero too uh, smoothly to the other values. I'll comment on this as I go later. Okay. Now, this is something I thought uh, I can uh, little bit uh, spend two minutes on this. So we would like to know, uh, is there a special correlation between local irreversible rearrangements near yielding? So we would like to uh, see this uh, 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 correlations uh, before the yielding occurs. And we were guided by this paper, uh, which talks of irreversible reorganization in a supercooled liquid originates from localized soft modes. So the point is where you have the uh, soft modes in that region, there they see in the simulation, they see irreversibility, irreversible particles. So we cannot measure this uh, soft mode frequencies in our experiment. So we took a jump and we said we will identify this local uh, soft mode regions by a local measure of elasticity by defining a debye wall factor for each particle, which is something which we know how to do. So we are looking at the position of the particle and we know its average position. Uh, this uh, average is defined how we calculate this average. And we uh, do this uh, for each particle and find out how this Debye-Wall factor uh, is distributed in our sample. And uh, I have explained it here, which I will not go into detail. This is all in our paper. But just to explain, this is the uh, this is done uh, uh, averaged over an oscillation cycle at uh, uh, second cycle for a particular gamma naught 0.25, and you can see that uh, you, this is the range. This is the high UI. This is the low UI. Yeah, the I. Yeah, this is this is the Debye wala for a particle I, and this is the distribution of P of UI square. And what we have superimposed, mm -hmm. these gray circles are the one where the we have the irreversible particles. So we see at the end of the cycle, which are irreversible particles, and we see that there is a beautiful uh, correlation of this localized soft regions, which have high debye wall factor, to this irreversibility, which means irreversibility is occurring in those regions, which is not surprising. This is what intuitively you would think. And the, so this is the, uh, for example, at uh, given gamma naught, very close to yielding, uh, we have uh, at, the th at the end of the third cycle, we have these clusters. Uh, these are the clusters defined by top 10% of the high uh, Debye-Wall factor. 
so we take a cut off and we say which particles have high ui and we just color them for uh, uh, making them very clear and we slightly increase their size to make them look very uh, clear to the market and all others are other particles and you can see that here uh, as you go uh, more and more cycles you have fewer larger clusters and they still persist even after 47 cycles and we quantify that how many clusters of which size of high Debye wala particles are there so our particles are defined these clusters are defined by top 10 percent of the high ui particles this is our measure and this is how we it looks like so these are for uh, three gamma nodes and this is for three uh, two uh, three windows so we average it because it's quite a noisy measurement in this so we have to average over let's say 2 to 10 20 to 30 37 to 47 this p of n you can see it goes right up to 20 particle cluster Wala, you can define if you have thermal agitation. How do you do it here? I Same thing. R, Ri minus Ri average. Where it's coming from can be different. Yeah. The definition yeah. is exactly same. the same. Same. Coming from here. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thermal. No, no, it's not thermal. It's not no, 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 shear and thermal. It's not Both. Non-affine non -affine right? movement. Yeah. Non-affine so movement. Why is it thermal? No, 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 not thermal. In this non-affine. No, no, I'm saying it is defined analog to that. Uh, analog to that, but it is the non-affine movement. Exactly. Exactly. Right? So you can see there are uh, some messages. I Again, sorry, I have 15 minutes. 15? Yes. So I'll finish in five. Huh. Yeah. So I'll put some <laughs> questions after that. Uh, so here, what I am trying to show, you can see that uh, uh, we, this is our uh, range of what we have uh, looked at. So this is just the distribution of cluster sizes. Cluster size of the high so mobile particles, and what we see is that at gamma y, you have this uh, clusters are large here in this thing, which is not so much here at uh, uh, when you are much beyond the yield and uh, pn is more or less stationary for all times so now uh, we wanted to get a cluster size now it's a power law so uh, uh, we don't know what to do with it so uh, Why do it's a power law. <laughs> uh, so we we follow what these people do in polymer science in polymer science people define a average cluster size n square p of n over n pn uh, so it's a uh, kind of it takes uh, uh, even for a power law you can define if the divergence is not too large or something and here this is the data the red one only you see please and this is the n average uh, this is not a huge increase but it is 20 percent increase but Ajay, i think your previous thing is much more convincing go back sure. to that, just the distribution when you're saying here this has a cutoff. There is a power law and yeah. power law. So yeah. the appearance of a cutoff is yes. clear. Right? Correct. So why would I look? Correct. This seems to be much more convincing that the power yeah. is getting Correct. Power. Correct. So, so this is precisely, so we wanted to go one step more and see if you can pull out a scalar number from this P of M. You know, uh, we are always anxious to plot something uh, to see if there is a systematic increase as a function of gamma naught. This is one measure. It could be another measure also. But what you see is an increase and then a decrease. And uh, uh, so this is the fact, the point which you have to uh, worry about. We are still doing in the velocity uh, vorticity plane. And these clusters you would expect like STZs and so on in the velocity gradient plane. So we are not imaging that. And so we are taking a cutoff of those clusters in that domain. And these are, uh, this is our uh, handicap. And uh, so we believe that this divergence should be much larger if we had done in velocity gradient plane. 
but within that uh, experimental limitation uh, it is this uh, probably that could be done more in simulations uh, not uh, so easy in experiments and th this is what is happening that the correlations between local yield events trigger a cascade of irreversible uh, arrange rearrangements which is manifested as a growing correlation length okay so this is the, these are the two conclusions uh, so far and now i'll come to the questionable parts so this is what the experiments are saying here they are consistent with some simulations uh, this like pines uh, results and there is uh, uh, some uh, state below gamma y which you can call uh, reversible one and then they uh, slowing down but more important is that there is a growing length scale which leads to probably growing tau in this picture now question is what are the other scene scenarios possible to explain this so in uh, very uh, uh, soon uh, when our paper was put on conmet uh, this uh, 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 by bauk binder and uh, his uh, collaborator they came out with a calculation of this uh, stz e stz based uh, model where of course all of you are experts on that which i don't know uh, much that you have uh, slow variables related to inherent structures let's say define chi uh, and you have a fast variable which defines the heat path and within a stz you have the rearrangements or the internal degrees of freedom so you have the dynamics of the internal degree of freedom how that variable changes which they call m for example in a two state model it will be 0 and 1 and chi uh, temperature this is what their model is and what they show is that above yield this is dictated by the time relaxation time of the effective temperature chi and this divergence is uh, above is 1 over gamma minus gamma gamma not minus gamma c similar to what you see in experiments in simulations in the stz based picture below uh, yield it's not very clear to me because the calculation as far as i know is not uh, it says it should be like this and they relate this to now the dynamics within stz this internal degree of freedom and that uh, they claim also slows down which is what the line is without uh, very explicit calculation and say that this could also explain the divergence of the tau seen in the simulation or experiment but the the this is again from their paper with but they note that in their model there is nothing like a growing correlation length because there are no stz uh, uh, growing correlation length and this is what uh, would not be captured uh, which we have observed 13 is our paper which will not be seen so again uh, it leaves a question mark whether this can uh, uh, the internal degree of freedom dynamics how it is related to actual thing which we are measuring we are measuring irreversible events and so on and this is something not very clear now this is the question i will just leave in uh, next 5 uh, uh, minutes with you whether this is settled in my view it is not settled what is the order of the transition is it a first order or a second order so far all the discussion is in the context of second order phase transition so that you have zero order parameter and increasing uh, smoothly from that but uh, 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 rec not recent uh, similar experiments in uh, uh, again dilute emulsions again doing oscillatory one they do uh, something more here and this is something i thought no uh, we had not done it and i don't think any other person has done they look at gfr of reversible particles and irreversible particles now they separate it but if they don't separate they show that if they look at uh, uh, much beyond or much away from this please look at this there is a peak at g of r equal to 1 sigma at 2 sigma which is what you expect for a uh, this hard sphere colloid but very close to uh, gamma y they start seeing a peak at 1.5 sigma and when they plot that strength as a function of uh, uh, delta over delta star this is a critical value they see a sharp jump 
and they claim that this is a first order transition not a second order transition and here it is interesting again they show that all the action is happening in the placing of this reversible events not the irreversible particles that is the beauty so uh, the uh, irreversible particle g of r remains the same but the uh, reversible particle uh, uh, this g of r is quite different and this is something uh, which they conclude that it's a first and this is a, from shrikant which uh, he presented in the uh, uh, earlier conference and if you look at uh, the size of the avalanche as a function of gamma max he probably uh, you can uh, quiz him when you go to very large system size there is a threat that it will be a jump but not yet so he tells me that they have more data to suggest that this jump in the avalanche size may be discontinuous but not yet shown so this is the last paper i want uh, for our community to see uh, how the uh, this is looked by itamar prakachias model parisi model and they are uh, uh, claiming that it's a first order transition defined by an order parameter uh, which is which measures the distance between two configurations a and b and they show that it has a discontinuous jump so this is probably uh, in may 2017 so at the end of the day we still feel it might still have room to play so now i'll make the speculation where are these events in glass this we i said clusters is there a way to understand that and uh, this i will uh, make a big jump uh, from the recent experiments which we have done uh, and this is the uh, uh, recently appeared paper which we show that within a glass you can talk of interfaces now it looks like a uh, quite a, a surprise but you can define a interface within a glass so i will not give you all the details but what we are saying is you can identify without any external potential the particles which are pinned they are self pinned around that you look at you calculate what is called persistence function and you can define a beautiful region which separates uh, the two regions and this is the interface which fluctuates and this fluctuations is governed by a surface tension which grows as you go to the glass transition and what we have shown is here we have superimposed that wherever this interface is that's where the most mobile particles are or crr as they call so all their mobility in the glass is occurring at the interface of this amorphous amorphous interface and uh, the conjecture is that the mobile particles irreversible events are really related to this amorphous amorphous interface which is what you would expect in a polycrystalline material but which uh, now we show you can define with a, uh, some persistence function uh, this idea of a amorphous amorphous interface so i think with this i close my talk and i'll be happy to answer so maybe for the following what i would do if it's a very uh, ajay is to have uh, elizabeth lead the, the discussion a bit around your talk and so the question can be more general question or can be more sure, sure. question for you so May I do just if you haven't signed up for the for the happy hour tonight, please do so. Uh, you should have gotten an email so that we know how much rum and how much tequila to get. There is a doodle. Just do so, okay? Otherwise, you'll be thirsty. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I have a question on the last slide. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'll remove this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on the last one. Yes. The yes. Okay. Now it's a general question, but um, how do you relate this uh, this speculation with the potential energy landscape picture? I mean, here you're saying that the events will happen when you have this interface between amorphous and amorphous system. So how does it relate with the potential energy? Is this interface like your point to set correlation? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it All of that order. Same? Of that kind order. of interface, yeah. right? Yeah, of that order, correct. Because there are different regions. So different this is like six sigma, sigma at uh, close to 
Maybe a connection, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. is uh, the uh, ASOS uh, or the Asian Association of Architects. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are, if you look, those are for thermal systems, but if you look into those uh, works, more or less uh, the things that were coming out is that uh, the, the soft modes, uh, are, the spatial distribution of the soft modes mm -hmm. seems to be correlated with this uh, irreversibly uh, rearranging regions, uh, and the soft modes, one can think, that are the tap direction in your landscape. So there one can see that maybe you can try to make some because this is where you will have the soft modes yeah, in those regions. Yeah. It's because not so obvious ones. because, they, of course, it's a very complex yeah. landscape. Yeah, yeah, but we have not looked at that. But, but you can define those interfaces no, dynamic. Okay, but you, you can do it from dynamically, or if I give you a snapshot, you can identify. No, where no. They so are. what we do is, so these really are not static impacts. It's really okay, dynamic. So these uh, these okay. will exist for certain, let's say, a few okay. tau alpha. You should you should frame frame the discussion because otherwise okay. people are just going to get lost. Yeah. So uh, just were there any specific questions before? I mean, this yeah. Maybe actually, on uh, what you are yeah. just discussing. Uh, so uh, this interface is essentially mapping out the more dynamically uh, mobile or heterogeneous. That's kind of the same. Right. So it's a, in another way, uh, here essentially you say that within the regions, products are more immobile, and uh, that's right. that's right. that is precisely the uh, point. To answer uh, Elizabeth's question, mm -hmm. so if you get. A, a, a picture or just a structure you will not be able to use. No. So the, if you look at the full mm -hmm. picture, <coughs> this uh, part, because you can't make out anything. Yeah. But if you now what the way we do is again, uh, it's a, you can read in the paper. So we look at, uh, let's say we divide the regions into small uh, mm -hmm. spaces yes. and find how long, uh, which are the ones where the things will persist and ones where they will yeah. not be persistent. And that uh, separates, if you look at this persistence function, it will vary from one to zero. Okay. And this defines a persistence, and this defines, uh, uh, you know, uh, the interface. Huh. So this is possible because we can look at the most immobile particles mm -hmm. and call them pins, and look how long the effect will be around that which is what people have done with external pins. Here we are doing with self-generated disorder, self-generated pins. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, as a follow-up from this, so how does this change with uh, strain? <laughs> we have not. Oh, you don't know. So this is no, without... No, we have not. This is without strain. This is without strain, okay. Uh, because this would re uh, essentially read with your irreversibility that you That's were saying. Right. That is exactly why I called it a speculation yeah. at this stage, because we are linking this to strain behavior. Yeah. In, a, in a sense, it makes some uh, physical intuition, but exactly these regions will be participating I have not. So yeah, more, yeah. You, you expect that this is a more irreversible result? Yes, that's okay. exactly. And then uh, if I go back to what you were showing, you were showing this irreversibility, different measures mm -hmm. as a function of strain. Uh, but you saw it at one, uh, if I understood correctly, one volume fraction, right? One more? Uh, one volume fraction. Oh, yes, you, yes, you yes. did not really no, look no, into the different correct. Okay. So in, in our experiments... But these are done for various volume fractions. Sorry. Okay, so then you might have... Without that. shear. All right, so then you might have uh, some answer. So <laughs> in our experiment, which we showed, which we were calculating the irreversibility by the echo, so you could see very, very clearly that you would have a very uh, a sharp drop of the reversible rearrangements or a very sharp increase of irreversibility at high volume fraction, whereas at lower volume fraction, still in the glass regime, the transition was very, very, very gradual. So in one case, you could maybe in your picture uh, okay. discuss about uh, first order transition, and the other one would You're be... You're saying that might depend on the packer pressure? Exactly. So, so uh, yeah. again, <coughs> speculation two. Um, now I am showing... Oh, 
Oh, I had a plot of uh, oh, I had a plot of surface tension of uh, these interfaces as a function of phi. And then if it goes to so very it is, small, it then jumps. It's it jumps at a certain volume fraction. Jumps. Jumps at MCT, phi MCT. More coupling theory. Yeah, but this is uh, still at rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. It everything is without shear. We are making a jump. See, first itself, I should go back. We didn't know how to define any interface within a glass. Yes, I understand. This is the sort of uh, last uh, sort of uh, idea that you, uh, uh, you you saw us. But if you go back to the previous uh, part where you were doing under a sear, and then you showed also the cluster size and so on. Uh, what I'm saying is that from our experiments, it seems that uh, there might be a very fast, very mm -hmm. sharp transition at high volume fractures, but a very, very gradual tra transition to irreversibility, to irreversibility uh, at lower volume fractures. Yeah. So we have we, not done that. This is all reflected a little bit in that uh, Knowlton or whatever that uh, where at 0.69 it is gradual change del y square, mm -hmm. but at, as they go to 0.84. It was very sharp. I yes. don't if you remember that. I can plot that. Uh... Actually, this was what How was long would you like to uh, Yeah, this one. Okay. So then I. So here in this paper, in this work, mm. 0.65, this mean square displacement uh, is gradual. Whereas come to 0.88, yeah, so it's same. very sharp. So it is related to that. Maybe which we, is can, uh, we can we mm can -hmm. have uh, Elizabeth uh, and uh, pushing her ideas. <laughs> <Sorry, right? Yes. laughs> yes. yeah. No, then we can. Uh, actually, I will need the, um, yeah. the blackboard. How do we? Yeah. yeah. I can close it now. Yes. Okay. I mean, sorry, I was saying for myself. No, no, I'm saying. So actually, I've been working on mean mesoscopic elastoplastic models, and I think many of the ingredients that you put in those models can be discussed here, given all the talks we had today and uh, the, during the week. So I just want to sketch briefly the main ingredients, and then we can talk about it. So uh, these uh, elastoplastic uh, scenario is the one that you all know, where you would say that at first, when you deform some amorphous material, at first you would have an elastic deformation, and when you have a given threshold that is reached, typically a local yield stress, sigma c, then you will have a locally a plastic rearrangement that will propagate the stress to the rest of the system, uh, and locally you will pick up a new value of, uh, of local yield stress because of the local rearrangement. And so that can be modeled on very naturally on a lattice model, where now you focus on the stress on a given site. It can depend on time. And on each site, you will also have a local yield stress that <coughs> also depend on time, because each time you will have a plastic event, you will uh, locally update the disorder you have. And so in those models, now you will have a couple of dynamics between uh, the local um, activity. You mentioned that in your talk at some point. Given but it would be good if you can connect at some point yes. this yes. stress-based activity on with this the, with the rearrangement. rearrangement yes. Actually... Because here there's no rearrangement, right? It's all just stresses. Yes, but there's a point in this model that somehow we, we start from assumptions on the on the stochastic rules of how a site becomes elastic and plastic. Yeah. Yeah. They're put by hand. Mm -hmm. Then we take some time to compute it, to study the model, but I think it could be really interesting to have more input on how to what to put on those uh, on those on these dynamics. Is so there a distance cut off up to which point it will generate the further plastic effects? Uh, I mean, that will depend on the local, I mean, you, you will give yourself a given distribution of the stresses and of the local yield stress, and then indeed, uh, sometimes it might just be one local uh, 
uh, individual. How does it affect the neighbors? neighbors. Ah, it will be with SLB. So just, yeah, so I just want to write one, it won't be long just to write the equations, but just to say that you will have the local activity that will be, so zero if it's elastic and one if it's plastic. And then you will have the local, just easier to discuss around this equation, I think. Uh, not all shear stress. And for this, we will say that the dynamics of this, uh, of the local stress at site I will be, for instance, the external driving. Here it's written for control shear rate, but of course you can also do for stress control uh, protocols. Plus, and this is where I will answer your question, you will have an SLB propagator, which tells you that when the site NG is active, so it's rearranging, rearranging then it will propagate its stress on a given time scale tau. And I want to separate the contribution of the site I itself, which might be uh, relax, relaxing. And E, S, E, tau. So in these models, they, we put here SLB, propagator, as you show that it's something that is really um, supported by experiments. Now, everything also uh, relies on the fact that you can define a typical size of rearrangements. So now if you have a distribution of sizes, um, when does this picture break down? Because you need to be able to define a lattice on which you can reorganize the events. But if the size of the events uh, is Powell or distributed, for instance, at some point it will break down. If you go too close to the jamming transition, the size of the events might become much larger. So again, when does it break down? And more importantly, I think also is that once you have this uh, equation, so you say here is the mechanical noise, it tells you how the, act the plastic activity in your system will uh, add fluctuation on the stress. You have here the local relaxation. But all the physics will be hidden on how your site becomes plastic to elastic. And so typically, you can assume, for instance, that if you look at the stress on one side, you will have fluctuation of the stress. So that will be given by the external driving. Then at some point, you will have a rearrangement. So this is n equal to 0, n equal to 1. And at some point, you will become elastic again. So n equal 0. So one, one choice you can make for the stochastic rules for this n could be to say, ah, you have here a local yield stress. Once I'm above, I have a typical time before I start yielding. Then I will have a typical time during which I will be plastic. And you can also include the, the typical time scale on which you relax. So you could write, study the dynamics just having those three typical times and how this would be related to experiments, uh, I mean, that, that would be a question. So there are many uh, different variations of these models that have been studied. There is actually a review by uh, Kirsten Martens, uh, Alexandre Nicolas, Jean-Luc Barra, and Ezekiel Ferrero. And uh, I mean, numerically, you can study those models, but you can also ask, okay, now if I just want to write not spatially resolved models, but directly mean field models in the sense that I just focus on the fluctuation on one site, and I say, okay, now I have my external driving plus a given noise with a given distribution. The, the big question is to know what would be this distribution. Mm -hmm. Actually, it will depend on the driving, <coughs> because if you drive very slowly, you have independent events, individual events. So when you look at the correlation of of your noise, what you will see is actually... So would that be the mm -hmm. kind of length scale that shows up in these, the correlation and the noise is... So you have the correlation in space and the correlation in time. Here, somehow you have removed space and you want to hide this correlation in space in, in the distribution. Yes. Yes. In, in the distribution, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And uh, do you have done any calculation with the oscillatory? Not yet, yeah. not myself. But that introduces also the issue of the reversibility time scale yeah. and yes. uh, uh, what, how, as, a, as a tool to sort of dig out your... Uh, no one has done oscillatory time. So, well, actually, if you take this model... Kinds of models? Like no, no oscillatory thing has been done on these models? No, it has been. Actually, Ebro has done... Uh, in, the, in the introduction of Ebro-Lecure, there was a uh, prediction for that. Um, 
But I want just to emphasize one point is that also what is important is to keep, to allow them in the model the change of the barriers. For instance, in the original Ebrolica model, you assume that you have a given local yield stress and when, which is fixed all the time, and you say that when the stress is above, then your stress will relax to zero with a given rate, for instance. Now if you allow just to have a distribution of local yield stress that you pick up at each rearrangement, on top of that, already in the steady state, you can follow the fluctuation of stress with the mean stress and predict the flow curve, but you can also study the fluctuation of the, of the barriers themselves. And in the steady state already, you will see that depending on how fast you shear, you will have a different distribution of the barriers that you have in your system. You, you will destroy more easily small and large barriers depending on the, the driving that you have. But you need for that to have from the beginning uh, a distribution of barriers in your model, which was not necessarily the case in, this, uh, in the first version of Ebre Le Queue, but in SGR, of course, that was one of the key ingredients. Um, and so the, the only point I want to, to make, and then maybe we can uh, go on with the discussion, is that when you write this type of mean feed models, usually you make ad hoc assumption on the distribution of the noise. For instance, you can assume that it's a Gaussian noise, white noise, so you neglect the correlation in time. Uh, if you take uh, the model by uh, Mathieu Viard and Gilin, they say that when you're close to the critical point, so now uh, by critical I mean the yielding transition, so when you hear, it's not a Gaussian noise, it's levy flight. Actually, what uh, I want to emphasize is that if you hear, the noise will uh, be closer to a levy flight, but if you go at a larger driving, then the distribution of the noise changes itself and it comes closer to a Gaussian noise. The idea is that if you write such a model, you should actually have really distribution that depends on the, and you should determine itself consistently. And that's the same also for the uh, distribution of barriers. So for the steady state, we can do it. We would like to do it for the oscillatory state as well. I mean, we have all the equations. Most probably, you can do it uh, numerically. You can try to have prediction analytically. So I'm doing analytical computations. This is why uh, I'm focusing on these mean field models. Can, can uh, I ask a, yes. a question? Yeah. Do, do you have an evolution equation for the local activity as well? Uh, no, here, uh, the, the equation is more of Boolean the dynamics. You say how it will go from 0 to 1. Okay. So every, but, but, but that's the dynamic. So you, yes. you change it from... Yes. Yes. And uh, actually, when you look at the different models that exist um, in this approach or in this one, you see, for instance, that when you include a given uh, restructuring time, which is finite, mm -hmm. then it changes a lot of dynamics. This is where you will have shear bending and pairing, uh, mm -hmm. even in mean field models. So. Okay. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm part, part of what was sort of uh, mm -hmm. I was going through my fuzzy little brain was mm -hmm. that I imagine I had set up a, a profile with a finite, a non-zero gamma dot, I turn gamma dot off, mm -hmm. and then I ask what's the relaxation of dynamics. And so depending on what the NIs are, I could relax to a state where the, the sigmas aren't zero. Yes. Is that right? Would that happen? Or am I just... If you stop, if you stop the shear, the place... Yeah. Uh, so then you just get rid of the gamma dot? Term. Yes. Okay, so you have non-zero values for the N ends and the sigmas, and then you turn off the gamma dot and watch the relaxation. Mm -hmm. so, then, so the sigmas then don't necessarily relax to zero, do they? Or do they? No. So, so in other words, the steady state would be where everything on the, where the, where the kernel term and the far right term uh, would balance. And so then it, it goes to a non-zero set of sigmas at the end. Actually, if you take, um, that will depend on the initial condition you have. If you have enough overstressed sites when you stop the shear, mm -hmm. then depending on the model, you might even have a non-physical steady state when you always have self-generated uh, self activity. Actually, that's one of also the problem of this type of modeling is that you start from the dynamics of the stress. Mm -hmm. So 
Actually, I don't know them well. Maybe Pascal <laughs> might do them better. Do you remember? Or? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll do it anyway. No, I was just thinking, in the interest of making a connection, like even with just the, yeah, and for with the Ajay's uh, talk, how yeah. we could yeah, yeah. use uh, that framework, uh, if there is a possibility to use that framework. I understand what Ajay. I don't know the predictions mm -hmm. either as uh, Pascal, but uh, um, for sure, once you start the oscillatory share, you can have prediction for these different quantities, I mean, the, the usual one, and really look at the scalings of uh, these quantities. So that gives prediction directly mm -hmm. that you can compare. Um, and also in that case, I guess, to understand how the noise or the correlation of the noise could be yeah. related to, for example, the behavior of G double prime. Yes. It is in the spirit of what Ajay was doing. That would have could, be could be very interesting, but it has not been done yet, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, at least, at least in this type of model. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things now that we would like to, to explore. But I think really it's important to also include, for instance, the distribution of disorder here and see um, those two ingredients, I think, are really important to, to have something that can describe. Already in the steady state, it's important because the faster you shear, you, you, the distribution of the barriers and of the noise will be crucial. But then in the oscillatory case, then it's even more crucial. So I think this is something that should be looked at. Now, a question that I have uh, given the talk also about the grains and all the forces chains. I don't know to which extent we can include this type of fluctuation of networks and correlation to this type of description to see if they can modify the exponents close to the critical point. I mean, if you have ideas on that, or I don't think it's crucial. I think to me the biggest difference <laughs> is the GIJ. See no. There is no elastic uh, SLB function in granular materials. No, non-frictionless or frictionless. This is all friction. All friction. Okay. Yes. This is where it makes frictionless. If you compress, mm -hmm. then it will become SLB, but. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's so. I guess one question is, could there, you, so, the, so the problem with the Eschel B1 is that you're assuming an isotropic material in which you have a perturbation. The material sure. is intrinsically and strongly anisotropic, but you, I suppose you could imagine, uh, you know, a, a more general elastic material which is anisotropic and still compute an Eschel B. I, I, so I, I think, mm. right, like yes, it, it's it's a, you, for the granular materials, we really need to go back to this thing that was hammered in by Bouchot and everyone, that you have to have a stress on the description. Strain doesn't make much sense. So, in this, so to me, this description is natural, except that you want to know, if I have a failure here, mm -hmm. how does that affect the stresses in the nearby things? And I don't think it's obvious to me at all that it's an isotropic elasticity or anything. Similar but, to that. But you could try that as a, as a way of bridging. Right. It this is quadrupolar, right? You put it in. By right, hand. but I'm going to break the quadrupole and make it a, a distorted quadrupole. That's true that you can put whatever you want here. Actually, that depends what you want to study. For me, you throw away so many things of the macroscopic dynamics that the thing that I would trust is the full curve and the fluctuation of the stress, because this is what you want to study with this type of yeah. models, right? So, of course, even for Lena Jones, it's not never SLB because it's completely heterogeneous, but they saw that when you average over hundreds, no, 100 of configuration, that was done by uh, Francesco Posi, Jean Lubara, and Jörg, I think you were on this paper as well. They measure, they, they saw that you have the SLB on average. So to retain just the average behavior already for heterogeneous material is a strong approximation. But if you want to study the steady state uh, behavior for the mean. So uh, I have okay. a basic problem in granular is I don't know what G prime and G double prime are. Okay. Because there is no definition of strain in, okay. in that. Right. So the question is then, how do you actually define this very basic quantities. rigidity quantities, and what mm. do you call what? Yeah. yeah. But I think the stress picture. I would say the stress picture works. You just have to work out what the stress response Once. is. It's really what I like with the stress picture is also that. You can even deal with packed systems when the particles are not conserved. For instance, we took a model of Leonard Jones particles which can appear or disappear because we wanted to model a, a cell division and apoptosis in the system. 
And then you can follow the stress. It's more difficult to follow the position of the particles because it suddenly disappeared. It was a mess. But then, uh, if you try yeah, to make, yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, no. Yeah. That's just that's just yeah. to say that in that case, what we did was to say that you have two contributions to the noise, the plastic noise, which is treated as it's usually done, uh, for, for instance, in hebreu le and then we just added an additional stress noise that will correspond to the fact that here you have the T1 rearrangements, and here that could be the disappearance or the div division of a, of a particle that will also propagate stress. And actually, there is an ongoing study on how actually the this propagation of stress happens, probably also an SLB. Um, so just by adding those two different <coughs> noises, we could predict with a very simple model, I mean, it was the Ebrolike model, and you just add this, that instead of just having the, um, the usual uh, uh, Herschel Buckler with one half behavior, at some point you will fluidize, you will recover uh, a Newtonian behavior, just because when you're below this uh, this shear rate uh, the um, at this time scale it's just the division apoptosis rate that fluid has your system so it was a very simple way to introduce a second noise with an additional time scale and the interplay could predict this type of behavior which was observed in, uh, in the numerical uh, results so I just wanted to also to Bob so mm -hmm. in, the, in your experiment with the glamour thing do you see any uh, so do you see this transition from, uh, in terms of the reversibility or irreversibility of the rearrangement? Uh, you, oh, you're asking me. You yeah, so so there's, there is minimal rearrangement, mm -hmm. but the problem is you a, a very tiny change in the system. I mean, you don't actually have to rearrange to change the forces. Mm -hmm. So I was just sitting here and thinking what we should do is Look for these times, but in our four space, we can do exactly the same thing, right? Like, do they come back? Do they come back? And this is precisely what we have done in the shear jam state. By so the overlap order parameter that Procaccia and Parisi came up with is precisely the one we use to identify the shear jam transition. That the overlap doesn't so change. So in your case, you would say that. But it's in four space because the particles change yeah, just by a tiny bit, and the force but change. But in your case, so much. you would. Those are the things that you would characterize as irreversible rearrangement. Uh, I think so, because basically what we are saying is in the shear jam case, we now everything is reversible mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, yeah, I, my overlap order parameter is essentially one. Mm -hmm. So you would think that uh, okay, so the, the analogy is this less some sort of thing. In force chain also it is reversible? It's not Particles I understand, but even in force chain? No, so the point mm -hmm. is, Particles are always reversible. Or very close to reversible. That doesn't tell you anything about the rigidity right. of the system. It's only when the forces are reversible mm -hmm. that you that the thing is rigid. Yeah, that you need both. Mm -hmm. So so I would say the other way. It's not that the particles are the particles are basically reversible, but that doesn't tell me anything about the rigidity. Not not anything about but it does it's not enough. It's necessary, but it's not so sufficient. Let me ask most basic thing. I, you must have discussed, but I, in a granular medium, is there an analog of gamma C where you make two states different? Well, I'm not yet clear. Well, sure, can you sure. say I mean, you drive it clearly? Yeah. So, so, of course, you can. There's always a yield stress for a granular Sorry? There's, they have, a, of course, they have a yield stress, right? So, is there a distinct right. difference between the two? Uh, on, on between. What's on one side of gamma C and what's on the other? Ah, right. In granular medium. I'm saying. So, so you, know, you have big rearrangements uh, after you get past gamma C. So, so the, of course, the, there's a substantial difference. But and one of the problems is you also induce shear banging. So the system stops being a homogeneous system, typically. Uh, so, so then, you know, you, you, it's kind of hard to say what happens on the right side of, of failure because it's not a homogeneous system. And, Everything is what's going on in the shear band after that. I mean, uh, it was supposed to be a package. So only with your new you experiments you would point 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 look at it. That's well, what you're well, saying. It, Where there is no shear banding. Uh, conceivably, but once that also means you got rid of the failure. So <laughs> I'm not sure that you know if that's going so to. So he designed the experiment so that it doesn't fail, right? So you could actually create the shear. Point is, you're creating a solid through shear, right? So let me say, sorry, I might have not, uh, I didn't show the data. In the bubble raft experiments, 
we have shear bands. Okay. Yeah. So even then you have oh, we this. Need to go. Yes, right. Yes. Then we have this. So what? I'm saying the shear bending does not kill it. I'm only saying. Okay. Well, you don't have the initial thing. The shear is creating the sun. In God's experiments, shear is creating the sun. Right. And then it yeah. is easier. No, I agree. I'm just saying that the shear no, no, no. bending in this system yeah. is not killing the divergence at all. I'm only saying no, no, no. it is over. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all.